put his hand over it. What did he say? He says we can see quite well. <laughs> Dr. Fred Hollows, eye surgeon, mountaineer, humanitarian. The old man got one right. The Fred man... Hollows could have made a fortune operating on the wealthy, but he's happiest among people like these, and people who could never afford those fees. Did she want you to do the other eye now? This eye doctor from New Zealand believes simply, the patient will see the doctor. In 1990, they made Fred Hollows Australian of the Year. Remarkable considering he's a New Zealander, born and bred. Indeed, he's one of our unsung heroes. Fred Hollows is now seriously ill, but in true Fred Hollows fashion, he continues to work to attempt to leave the world a better place. God bless you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But think, forget about the God business. What about her side? What does she think about her side? Fred Hollows calls himself a do-gooding bastard. In fact, he's a gifted surgeon with a rich heart. His aim, nothing short of eradicating cataract blindness in developing countries. I think the essence of being a human being is um, helping others. And um, I don't want to, I mean, this sounds too sort of uh, Mother Teresa-ish, but in fact, you know, the, um, the thing that characterizes human beings is that human beings know about charity. They know about looking after the halt, the lame and the blind. And they don't in fact push the weaker side to get to the trough. Insofar as they do, they're acting in an inhumane way. The outback of Australia, the mid-1970s. This was where Professor Frederick Cossum Hollows first made a name for himself when he undertook a major campaign to improve Aboriginal health. Have you got any glasses? No. We might try to test you for glasses to see if we might make you see a bit better, eh? The hard facts are that in an affluent country like this there are incredible pockets of poverty and disease, including eye disease. Hollows made headlines when he criticised the authorities for what he described as the appalling state of Aboriginal health. See this rabbit, you can come here for us to have a look at you. Then, in the mid-80s, Fred Hollows took voluntary medical teams to some of the poorest, the most forgotten places on earth. In Africa, in Nepal and Vietnam, he's trained local health workers in Western surgical techniques. Very bulba. Yeah. <laughs> not Balinish, it's Bainish. Uh, yeah, Balinish. Balinish. The most dramatic operation is the one that cures cataract blindness. The natural lens, which has gone cloudy, is replaced with an artificial lens made of plastic. It's called an intraocular lens and it restores sight immediately, almost miraculously. Now everybody in the West, everybody in New Zealand, Australia, in the developed world, when they get their cataracts out, get this, a lens like this put into their eye because they can afford it. But five out of six of the people who go blind each year from cataract don't get this. Now what we're on about is making these intraocular lenses in poor third world countries at a price that third world people can afford. How many? How many now? Yeah, uh, he's got to be all right. Fred has travelled the world, often with his wife Gabby and their children, to restore sight to the blind and to train local surgeons. But time is running short. I've had a, a, ca a cancer of my left kidney that spread to my lungs before I realised it. And it's, uh, oh, it's spread to, you know, 30 or 40 different positions around my body. Are you dying? Oh, yes, I think so. Well, are you dying? I mean, is your death less certain than mine? It isn't, is it? Are you... Are you angry that you've got this devastating illness? No, I'm not. I'm angry that I feel unwell. Because I'm a sort of person who's been vigorous. You know, I've been a marathon runner and a mountaineer and I... And not only that, I've sort of the sort of bloke who got to work early and ripped into things and did things, you know? And now I can hardly drag myself 
across the surface of this uh, earth. These days, the doctor's having to spend less time in the surgery and more time at his home in Sydney. Oh, what's the matter? Despite the illness, which daily saps his strength further, the Hollows house is abuzz with activity. Friends, family, supporters, media. Yeah, yeah, but look, I've, I've been bad, mate. But there's still the work, despite the prospect yeah. of death. It's made me, uh, it's given me a sense of urgency about some projects. And it's probably emboldened me to speak out when previously I wouldn't have. Although people would, would uh, I've been characterised as being outspoken a long time before I developed this illness. You, you call yourself a do-gooding bastard, don't you? And you've spent a great deal of your life helping, helping those who need you, helping the blind. Is, is there anything in your early life in New Zealand, do you think, that was pointing you towards that? Well, it depends on how early. I mean, at a time, I mean, I'm looking back, the times when I was formulating my ideas of social values were the time of the Depression. And I had a very uh, socially aware mother and father who, uh, you know, who continually reminded me me and my brothers, how lucky we were that there were a lot of people unemployed, that my father had a job and that there were people going hungry. And that's, you know, I grew up in that time at a time when I was, when my affect was being formed, was in the depression in North East Valley in Dunedin. Fred Hollows was born in Dunedin in 1929, the second son of Joe and Clarice Hollows. Fred's father was an engine driver and provided the children with what Fred calls a respectable working class upbringing. The Hollows family were church going folk and a big part of Fred's teenage years were taken up with boys brigade. At secondary school Fred made the first 15. He wasn't a natural but Fred had stamina and enthusiasm which would later become his trademarks. In 1948 Fred began studies to be a minister before switching to medicine but he's held on to the basic beliefs of his father, Joe Hollows. He was a Christian socialist, really. I mean, he, he, um, I mean, he just really believed, well, first of all, he was a Christian. He converted to Christianity at some mission, or I think he was brought up a Presbyterian in a nominal way, and my mother was a nominal Anglican, and they both uh, became Church of Christ at some uh, mission that was being held. But uh, he was a Sermon on the Mount sort of Christian, you know. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And, uh, you know, let him who is perfect cast the first stone. That sort of basic stuff. And he also, he always believed that the social products of man were greater than the individual products. And that, um, that men owed most of their benefits to the fact that they were social animals. How did he practice this, uh, this, this Christianity, this respect for the social aspect of man? Did he do good works? Um, yes, he did. He helped people uh, quietly, unobtrusively. Like father, like son, Fred dedicated his life to others too. He would continue to be passionate about helping his fellow human beings, and he's always been there with the people who needed him most. Good work, Bunny. Good. How long has he been like that? Good. Yeah, just come back. Fred Hollows went to Australia in 1965. He had a comfortable job in a university, but the primitive conditions of the outback took his attention. In 1971, he helped set up Australia's first Aboriginal medical centre. Fred was always a political animal. He'd even joined the Communist Party in New Zealand, and he soon became a champion of the rights of Aborigines to have the same health care standards as white Australians. Among the Aboriginal stockmen, he discovered a particular eye condition caused by harsh reflected sunlight. There were many eye problems which, among white people, would have been treated promptly. To Fred Hollows, this was unjust, and he was never one to stand by. 
He rustled up support for a massive health program to test eyes all around rural Australia. But not just studying eye problems, he and his team treated many of them. The Hollows Maxim, no survey without service. And they spent two years in the outback, and Fred was a hard taskmaster. The poorest people were entitled to the same standard of care as the rich, and he got things done. The team is credited with halving the incidence of curable blindness among Aborigines. There were a whole lot of people blind who either could be cured by an operation or had they had the right care previously would never have been blind. And, and that's, it was exactly, I mean everybody you saw who was blind in white metropolitan Australia I, they'd all seen ophthalmologists many times. And they're coming in to see me as secondary, tertiary or quaternary consultations. And mostly there was nothing you could do. Here there were people lying in this black camp, blind simply because they hadn't had their cataracts out. And there was also another blinding disease, trachoma. Trachoma, that's a chronic conjunctivitis that shows signs in childhood and blinds you in middle age. There was no trachoma in white Australia and you know and 80% uh, of the kids in Waddy Creek, the first camp I ever saw, had trachoma. Not only that, they had this, all of the stockmen who had worked for 20 years or more on the cattle stations up there had this hazing of the front of the eye and uh, we'd never seen that in white Australia. We have since, very rarely. but. So, so serious eye problems were extremely widespread. One in Aborig four of all the Aborigines over the age of 60 were certifiably blind. Out of 67,000 Aborigines we examined. So you started the trachoma project. How did it work? We assessed the state, the ocular state of Aborigines and whitefellas. We examined 67,000 Aborigines and 38,000 whitefellas. Uh, and we did. If they needed an, an urgent operation straight away, we did it. Now, if they needed glasses, we provided them 10,000 pairs. Uh, we did over 1,000 operations. And we planned further surgery and further trips and so on. You spent over two years in the back blocks. It was an amazing experience. And uh, the people still who were in it still talk about it as being the highlight of their, uh, their, their professional careers. And overall, looking back... What did you achieve? There are fewer Aborigines, significantly fewer Aborigines on that conveyor belt to blindness now. And we set up standards, like we defined the basic home hygiene necessary to prevent this chronic conjunctivitis, because it's a disease of uh, poor home hygiene. You know, we spelled out that every house must have reticulated water at the rate of 100 litres per person per day, that there must be elevated, ventilated and separated sleeping spaces, that there must be cleanable surfaces, that there must not be dirt floors, that there must be one shower for every 10 people and one toilet for every 10 people and there must be um, insect screens on the wall. Now that, every time the federal government funds an Aboriginal house, those criteria are adhered to. So. Um, I'm quite happy to accept an Australian accolade for work in Aboriginal and overseas public health. And I, that's a, has a particular piquancy to me because not many ophthalmologists receive accolades for work in public health. So I'm not ashamed of that. And perhaps the greatest accolade was being made in 1990, Australian of the Year. And it was during the Australian Outback experience that he met the woman who would become his wife, Gabby. Now, just Linda, I just want to measure you up now. I want you to look at me. I want you to look at my finger, okay? Gabby tested eyes during the National Eye Program, and not just those of the locals. Okay, just try the big one again for me. I want you to look at my finger, okay? Can you remember what it was that made you fall in love with him? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I guess so. I don't know. I think he was probably a little bit more... Um, arduous. Arduous. No. <laughs> he was a bit of an old flirt and I thought, probably thought he was a dirty old man. But no, no, I, I've always admired Fred from when I was a student and I guess he's got a very, you know, a lot of, a very magnetic personality and I think that's probably why we sort of just clicked in there. <laughs> I don't know.
Fred and Gabby have been together ever since that first eye program. They've continued to work and travel together and Gabby remains one of the strongest supporters of Fred's vision which is nothing less than to wipe out cataract blindness in the third world. Fred Hollows has always been a battler and the mountains have always been a challenge. As an Otago medical student, he would head often into the Southern Alps and since shifting to Australia, he's returned to New Zealand regularly for climbing. What's the attraction about mountain climbing? Why would you want to do that? I mean, is, is it purely physical? The thing about mountaineering is that you put yourself on the line. You are risking yourself, your very existence, day in and day out. That's one thing. The other thing is, day in and day out, you're being cold or hot and tired and sore and hungry and thirsty. And it teaches you the limits of physical existence. It gives you a sort of a feeling inside that nobody can take away from. I mean, you do that and then come back and somebody says, look, Fred, you're a you're a bloody idiot for doing something or else, or challenge, you don't bother about it. I mean, why should I get worried about this bloke chastising me or saying something bad about me? I mean, the thing is, I survived. That love of mountaineering is something he shares with another great New Zealander, Sir Edmund Hillary. On Fred Hollow's first climb in the Mount Cook region, he had a chance meeting with a young Ed Hillary. We'd climbed a mountain and the next day was bad weather and I was sitting in a hut called Malterbrun Hut with a friend and uh, my friend Len Wilson looked out and he saw four climbers coming in. Now at the end of this 16 mile walk he had about a 500 foot scrabble up a moraine wall which on your first day out with heavy packs is really quite a sweat and uh, this fellow Len, this friend of mine said we should go down and carry a couple of their packs up. So we scuttled down the moraine wall. The first two chaps of the four strided, uh, strode past us and we let them go. And then the next two blokes came in and we said, we'll carry your packs up the moraine wall if you like. And these two big tall fellows said, well, it's not really necessary, but seeing you here, and, uh, and I got Ed Hillary's pack. I picked up his pack. Remember, it had two big salamis sticking out of the top of it. Well, he gave me his pack and it just about broke my back. I could have carried it up myself, but uh, seeing he had offered, I uh, happily gave this very hefty load to him. And I can remember his knees sagging a bit when it came onto his back because it really was a, a very heavy load. And that was my uh, first uh, association uh, with Fred Hollows. But I think in many ways it was significant in that even in those days he was willing to come down the hill and help someone else to uh, lug a load up to the camp. As well as their passion for mountaineering, Hillary and Hollows shared a deep concern for the people of Nepal. Both New Zealanders have ended up there at different times in the 60s, Sir Edmund was building schools and hospitals for the people of Nepal, while Fred Hollows was still back in New Zealand training as a doctor. It would be another 20 years before Fred arrived on the scene. It was Fred's love of the mountains that first drew him to Nepal. It was his love for the people which kept him coming back. In Nepal, thousands of people were blind with cataracts and this made them virtual outcasts. If you can't see in Nepal, you can't work and support yourself, you become a burden on your family. I feel in many ways uh, that the, uh, the blind tend to be very neglected and, um, and you're more likely to see them almost crawling around uh, the uh, narrow tracks 
and or just sitting in the sun uh, without any friends and without anything to do. I think it's a very sad situation uh, for blind people uh, in Nepal. In Nepal, conducting eye clinics in the mountains, Fred met a local doctor who was already a skilled eye surgeon, Dr. Sanduk Ruit. They worked together, they swapped techniques, and they became close friends. Not too high, not, not too, too high. Not too high. <laughs> <laughs> not too high. We're not going to be walking far, are we? No, no, no. And as always, Fred Hollows trained localized surgeons to carry on the work, avoiding the development of a dependency on him or his team. <laughs> We've made a few small investments, you know, perhaps a hundred or hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And we have got going here a program of modern eye surgery. Eye surgery that is every bit as good as that done in Sydney. Corny is a bit hazy. Wouldn't be a bad idea to give him a bit of Diamox. Well, yeah, Diamox, okay. No in more. No in? Yeah, or a Diamox, I'll go, sorry. But we are playing a development role. Some countries still send teams of surgeons from the Occident, from Western Europe or America, to third world countries to do surgery on the poor. And uh, we're opposed to that. That's old-style missionary stuff. We're uh, interested in developing indigenous surgeons. If you don't want to serve, don't do medicine. Because the whole tradition of medicine is going to the sick and tending to the sick. It's no good being a smart doctor if you're all the time out on your... Uh, Kiwi fruit farm outside Tipuki or wherever they grow kiwi fruit these days. You've got to be, uh, and that's one of the great drags of medicine, you know. You have to get up in the middle of the night. You have to uh, tend to the sick when they're sick, not just when it happens to be convenient to you. You worked in Auckland for a period, didn't you, in those early years? You worked as a GP. I worked as a locum in my, as a fifth year medical student, and again, as a sixth year medical student but I later I needed money to go to England and um, to specialise. I decided by this time I was going to become an ophthalmologist and uh, I'd been working in practices and getting 30 pound a week which was much better than a house surgeon got but I realised that that practice may have, may have been making 300 pound a week you know the principal of the practice would be lying on Waiheke Island while old Fred's up to his elbows in, uh, in blood and gore doing all his work, you see. And I thought, well, if I've got to get some money together... So I went out to see a bloke in Otahu called Robert Bruce, great doctor. And the first thing he said to me was, general practice is a business. And I thought, right, we'll talk about this. Anyhow, we came to a very good deal, and I worked harder in that year than I worked anywhere. And Robert Bruce taught me a lot. So, you're famous now. Fred Hollows is famous. He's successful. Uh, you're honoured. How's all of that changed you? I'm also <laughs> decrepit. <laughs> well, look, the, the, um, the, the thing that fame's done to me is destroyed my anonymity. I mean, I'm walking home, sucking my pipe, thinking of um, my own thoughts, and I'll just be walking along, and somebody who's about to pass me on the right will suddenly veer over towards me and I thought, hello, what's this? And all he's doing is putting his hand out to say, good on you, Fred. Keep it up. But sometimes even the miracle worker can do nothing. You ask him if he can see, see the light. This boy went blind four years ago. He cannot see the oh, What a pity. So he, he could well be a vitamin A deficiency. Yeah. And he's just perforated both corneas. There's no point in doing a corneal graft on him or anything. Yeah. It's irreparable. Irrevocable is blindness. Now. Isn't that a pity? Poor he's, um, yeah. How old is he, Fred? They, they say he's ten. Gee, look at the size of him. He's malnourished and so stunted and small. And a good pair of feet, don't A good pair of feet, eh? What's his name again? rugged mountains and the stony valleys of Eritrea in northeast Africa, 
hot, difficult, harsh. Fred Hollows became interested through an Eritrean he met in Sydney and he came here first to Eritrea in 1986. The Eritreans had been at war with Ethiopia for over 25 years. And hidden away, underneath the ground, the Eritreans had built a hospital. Look up, Alanis. Come on. Come on. Here, Fred operated and taught at night. He gained an enormous respect for the Eritreans' resourcefulness. Yeah. I was operating one night, and uh, you started operating about six o'clock then, and you operated through, and, and we finished the operating list about half past two or three o'clock. And then the Eritreans said to me, we are now going to take you to the pharmacy. And I thought, you know, God, we've been operating for eight hours. And it's all at night, so you, and it's all up creek beds, and you've got to stumble up there. And I thought, God, I'm going to stumble up this bloody creek bed and find, go into some dugout, because everything was sort of dug in and that sort of stuff. And um, I'm going to look at a, a series of shelves with bottles of pills on them which isn't the sort of thing that excites an eye surgeon at three o'clock in the morning. So anyhow, we, then I thought, well, wait a minute, the Eritreans aren't that stupid, you know. They, their uh, track record, as far as I was concerned, was very good. So we went up there, and the first room we went into, we opened the door, and there was a blaze of light, and there was this, these bloody machines making anti-malarial tablets. The first thing I walked into was a machine spewing out 50,000 anti-malarial tablets an hour. So the first room they're making anti-malarials, the second room they're making anti-tuberculosis drugs. But then the last room I went into, they showed me a thousand half-litre packs of intravenous fluid. And I'd been using this fluid to irrigate the eyes. I was showing them the new types of cataract extraction and so on and the new way to deal with complicated eye wounds by keeping the eye spherical and inflated by running fluid in. So I knew their intravenous fluids were good. Now it's when I saw that, that's when the penny started to drop in my thick skull. That if these people, because the quality control requirements and the attention to detail in making those three things were exactly the same things as are needed to make intraocular lenses. The conflict ended and the Eritreans began to rebuild after 30 years of war. In 1991, Fred visited the country for the fourth time. He was reunited with some of the people he'd trained, people who will never forget him. Fred Hollows had helped bring hope when few in the West cared. He is a friend, he is a father, and he is, he is a teacher. The devastating war left behind thousands of casualties. Many people lost eyes through war injuries as well as disease and landmines are still claiming limbs, still claiming eyes. You know, anti-personnel mines litter ten of the poorest countries on earth and uh, blowing up children and farmers in countries like Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, Angola, Mozambique, Kurdistan, Afghanistan, Eritrea, Somalia and Ethiopia. So the people who make mines and make money out of making mines should think long and hard about what they're doing, because this is what they're doing. They're just blowing up country children. It is that sort of blunt talking that's made this New Zealand eye doctor a folk hero in several countries. And the fact that the Australians love him and give him money means he can pursue his vision to transform the lives of people who have neither sight nor hope. She likes to hold my hand. Good hands, eh? Nice long fingers. Good on you, love. What have you achieved there? What have you accomplished in Eritrea? I tell you, see, Africa has one eye doctor for every million and a half people. In fact, after Africa has fewer functioning, busy eye surgeons 
for a continent of 550 million people than we have in this continent for 18 million people. What the first, the, one of the most significant things that we've done is we have trained a group of five Eritrean health workers, not medically qualified, not even in the middle or the upper echelons of health workers, to do modern cataract surgery with lens implantation. Now that's the first thing we've done there. And nobody's ever done that. The other thing that we've done is we're putting in an intraocular lens factory. The intraocular lens is the piece of magic that makes, um, you see in a human eye, here's a, a bisected human eye, you'll see that there's two lenses, the cornea and this lens here. And it's, a, it's inside the eye. That's the thing that when you're young enough, that's until you're 40 or 40 odd, gives you focusing power. And um, it's, th it's in this that you get opacities that are called cataract. Now, previously what we did up until the early 80s when we took out cataracts, we took it out. And then people had to wear a very thick lens in front of their eye, which had all sorts of optical problems. It made everything one third larger, therefore one third closer. So people wouldn't, didn't know where they were in relationship to the common objects of their environment, which is very disturbing visual information, very disturbing sensory input. And there was also patches of the visual field that they saw nothing in. Now, there's a bloke, Harold Ridley, a pong, nice chap, big sort of toothbrush moustache, and I worked with him a little bit in London. But uh, he noticed that pilots in the battle for Britain would get bits of perspex, windscreen of the aircraft inside their eye, and these bits of perspex would sit there uh, and cause no biological reaction. They were biologically inert. And old Harold Ridley, like so many of those <coughs> palms, he uh, said, well, you know, we could make a lens and put one back in. And he did. Of course, it was a very expensive business. Oh, yeah, sure. Well, and everybody in the West gets that surgery. But everybody in the third world, virtually, gets the old type surgery because it doesn't require the intraocular lens, which is made in the West and priced for what the Western markets can stand. Uh, 150 to $350. And, and you're making them for how much in Eritrea? See, we're talking about a lens that's going to cost no more than $5. Oh, I see something under a rack. A factory to make these intraocular lenses in Eritrea is being pre-built in Australia, paid for by the Fred Hollows Foundation. An Eritrean toolmaker is there to help and to learn how to build other factories in Eritrea. The factory will make cheap lenses, not just for local operations, but hopefully to earn revenue for Eritrea by selling lenses to wealthier nations. 101 components. Um. Vietnam, one of the most populated and poorest countries in the world, just the sort of place to find Fred Hollows. He came to Vietnam in 1992, bringing a team of eye surgeons and a cargo of medical equipment. Seriously ill himself, still he came. I've always had a soft spot for Vietnam, rather like Eritrea. Uh, a, a heroic country, fought for its independence for a long, long time. Jealous of its own reputation and uh, the sort of country where we think, given a bit of assistance, uh, it'll do things. But she's, she's doing very well, isn't she? <laughs> Put your glasses back on, beautiful one. <laughs> she's a beauty, isn't she? In Vietnam, about 130,000 people need cataract surgery every year. Few receive it. And this can be cured with one operation. Yeah, yeah, this can be cured. Usually in Vietnam, only the very rich can afford intraocular lens transplants, but that's changing thanks to Fred Hollows. That's the sort of microscope we hope to be able to make here in Vietnam. <laughs> we 
When he arrived in Hanoi, the great white doctor from down under caused quite a stir. But as always, he wasn't there to put on a show. There were patients to be operated on, and young doctors eager to learn the latest techniques. Fred and his colleagues were soon passing on their skills to the Vietnamese. The aim, as always, help the local people help themselves. Teach the teachers first, and then the teachers can teach others. And then... Fred couldn't operate, so debilitating are the drugs he has to take. But he knows the work will continue because of the charitable foundation set up in Australia and more recently in New Zealand. The Fred Hollows Foundation is an organisation set up by a group of people who have been working with me. I cringe a bit at the use of my name, uh, but the, the aim is to make the world a better place, which is sort of a global motherhood statement, right? Or leave the world a better place. That's our motto. But we have our major interests at the moment are setting up three models of modern cataract surgery in three of the poorest countries on earth, Eritrea, Nepal and Vietnam. We have in place the means of getting that surgery done, modern surgery, surgery every bit as good as you can get in any place in New Zealand uh, that restores sight fully and rehabilitates them. Of course, we have to look to what you need for that. And you need intraocular lenses. And our three prime objectives are to get intraocular lens factories. And they are being made here in Australia and are being trialled before shipment. You also need local anaesthetics and drugs and things to inject into the eye. And uh, the New Zealand, the New Zealand uh, part of the foundation is going to help us with that. So we hope... We've got all sorts of plans. We hope to have Eritrea, for instance, a place like Australia, cataract free. We hope that there'll be nobody blind in Eritrea in four years' time simply because they haven't had a cataract out. The foundation, what does it mean to you personally? Well, I mean, the footprint that I'll be leaving in the sand will to a, a considerable extent. I mean, I've left a lot of footprints. I have trained, you know, 40 or so eye surgeons, and some of whom are uh, as good as any in the world. Uh, some are better than most of them in the world. But the uh, Hollows Foundation will carry on doing... The, it's, it's the structure, or it's part of the structure, that, um, that, I, that will be left behind partly because of my efforts. Now, it's not, it, it's not a one-man band. Uh, and they use my name for obvious reasons. And despite time running out, Fred Hollows feels an urge to drive forward, one which puts even his own family into second place. Fred's young family see a lot of him. Well, they always did. But whereas other people diagnosed with cancer might retreat from life to spend their last months quietly, Fred Hollows has stepped up the pace, has determined to pack his life with the riches he values. Before the end comes. See, death is the one aspect of life that I have yet to experience. You know, I have in my office a photograph, or two photographs, taken in 1913 by a German photographer. And that one of the shows a, a chap called Fortino Samano having his last smoke. And he's got his hat, he's got a, a felt hat, rather like an average Australian hat, at a rakish angle. And he's got a cigar in his mouth that he's chomping away on and smoking. And his hands are in his pocket and he's standing upright. The next photograph is just as the commander of the uh, firing squad drops the sword and the bullets rip into his chest. Now he's standing there without a blindfold. He's taken a handkerchief out and put it in uh, his left chest pocket so as the people will know where to shoot him. 
and he's standing there with his hat in one hand, his hands back, looking at the firing squad, saying, uh, if he was an Australian, he'd be saying, shoot me, you bastards. But he, uh, you see, he chose the way he died, and he died with dignity. When you're gone, though, Fred, what would you like people to say of you? Oh, well, <laughs> you know, death's one of those things that you never live to regret. And I'll never live to hear what they say about me. But um, uh, I hope they won't say the things that would annoy me, like such as he didn't care about the work he was doing. Because I, I heard a bureaucrat say that about me once. And um, I threatened to sue him for every cent he had and every cent he was ever going to earn. And he shook like a dog shitting razor blades after I'd finished with him. I mean, you can't say that to any doctor. Well, I, I'd, you know, I'd like to think that I'd say, well, look, Fred helped set up the Aboriginal Medical Services. Fred helped to uh, get some decency into Aboriginal health. And uh, Fred helped to... Uh, disseminate modern cataract surgery to people who previously had been considered too poor to afford it. Those are the sort of things I'd like said about me. Um, you know, they all sorts of people say he's a cranky old bastard who was uh, intolerant and... Um, difficult was a word used, I think. I guess I was a bit difficult, you know. Um, uh, I was a really only difficult... Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that... That's legitimate. I mean, if that's the worst that's said about me, I wouldn't be worried about it. But what about your family? Your, your loved ones? The, the prospect of leaving so early a young family? Very young family. Mate, I'm 63, uh, which isn't very early. If you, if you, uh, I mean, there's plenty of people, you know, uh, who have entered history in a much more significant way than I'll ever enter it, who have died with less than half my years up. And I'll probably live look, twice as long as Jesus Christ. So um, I can't object to the uh, biological hand that nature's dealt me, can I? But Fred and Gabby have agreed that even now, indeed especially now, his work must take priority over family to make sure everything is set in place. We will have models of sustainable blindness prevention programs in two of the poorest countries on earth. And uh, my inconvenience and uh, my family's inconvenience is a small price to pay for that. With time running out, he seems still to be spending so much time on his project. Do, do, you, do you resent that? No, I don't. I said that before. I, I, I really, I'm absolutely, totally behind him. I'm probably even more insistent that these things happen and, uh, than, uh, than Fred does because I just feel that, that uh, ophthalmology has got so much to offer and, and Fred has got so much to offer people and I'm very happy to share Fred with, uh, with everybody because, uh, you know, he's a pretty special person and, and uh, he gives us a lot of time. We have a lot of time and we do a lot of things together. So most of the things that he's doing passionately, he is doing with us too. I may, physically may not be together sometimes with him if he's away overseas or whatever, but as much as we can, we go wherever Fred goes. Once again, cancer or no cancer, Fred Hollows was in Auckland in November with his family to help launch the Fred Hollows Foundation in New Zealand. And one of the patrons, a soulmate. I do think that Fred is someone of uh, great determination, very practical uh, in his outlook, and he's certainly uh, extremely determined. And he's certainly a bit of a battler. And I admire that aspect of him. The aim of the foundation here in New Zealand is to raise half a million dollars. The money is needed for intraocular lenses, needed for a pharmaceutical factory in Eritrea, needed to sustain work which has sprung from the vision of one man, a doctor with a will to serve, Frederick Cossum Hollows. You know, as they say, a, a woman's time has arrived when she goes into labour, into the, the birth process, and a man's time has arrived when he looks at death. And um, the point is, it's 
it's going to be your time and my time. And I think very few of us can predict with certainty how we're going to go. But it's one of the great challenges. It's a bit like, um, like climbing a mountain that you don't really know whether you can climb or not. <laughs> and you have that, that sort of uh, anxiety and anticipation. I'd like to think uh, that uh, once my death is over, I'd uh, have the same feelings that uh, I uh, have when I've climbed some mountains with, with friends that I never thought I could have climbed. This program was made with the help of your broadcasting fee, so you can see more of New Zealand on air.